there were all kinds of animals, but they called them animal people because, well, they were all on the earth and they talked to each other, and uh, sometimes they were even star people. So this is a story about a rattlesnake. A rattlesnake, wow. Well, back then, the rattlesnake had a rattle, but no fangs. And back then, the North Star, which lived on the earth, the North Star was kind of a bully. So the North Star would make fun of rattlesnake. Would say, na 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 na, you don't have any legs, and you don't have any arms, and you just slither along in the dirt. You're always dusty and dirty. You probably have dirt all over your face. Na 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 na. That was not very nice, huh? No, not very nice. And after a while, the snake, the rattlesnake, got pretty tired of being teased and bullied by the North Star. But what could he do? He finally went to the Earth Mother and said, I'm tired of this. That North Star is such a bully. Isn't there something I can do? And the Earth Mother said, hmm, you need a way to defend yourself. I know. I will give you two sharp sticks. And that way, if anybody like the North Star starts to bully you or tease you, you just poke those sticks into them. Yeah, said the rattlesnake, but that's probably not going to work for me because I don't have any hands. I can't hold sticks. And Earth Mother said, well, maybe you could put them in your mouth. And the snake said, yeah, I could do that. I could put those two sharp sticks in my mouth, right at the top of my mouth, and that way, if North Star ever decided to bully me again, I could just chomp down and stick him with my sharp sticks. Good idea, said the Earth Mother. And here's what else you can do. I'll make it so that there's a poison in the sticks so that that will hurt him even more. And how you will know if the poison is extra strong is if it's much, much hotter than usual for three days in a row. So, the next time that North Star was teasing Rattlesnake, said, na, 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 look at you. You don't have any arms, you don't have any legs. You are always dirty. You have dirt on your face, you have dirt on your body. You probably have dirt in your mouth. Oh, well, Rattlesnake rattled his rattle to say, better cut it out. The North Star just kept teasing. And so Rattlesnake opened his mouth and with those two sharp little sticks, chunked right down on North Star's hand. Yeah, chomp so hard, chomp one of his fingers off. That's what the story says. And the story says that that was a long, 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 long time ago. And there are rattlesnakes that still live on the earth. And they still have sharp fangs in their mouths. And they're still sometimes poison. They say that if they're three days that it's extra, extra hot, you know that that means that the poison is extra strong. And if you look up in the night sky, there is, you can see the North Star. And if you look at the North Star, you'll see that there's some stars that look like a hand with five fingers. One of the fingers is shorter than the others. And that's the finger that was chomped off by a rattlesnake so long ago. Well, that is a story that was told to me by a member of the Lusania tribe. Her name is Kathleen Chilcote Wallace. And she said that I could have permission to tell the stories. I don't know if you know this, but very often native stories are told mostly in wintertime because they figure you shouldn't be just sitting around telling stories in the summertime. You should be out there working in the summertime. But in the wintertime, there's less work to do, so you might as well just sit and listen to stories. So particularly coyote stories. Coyote stories are never told in the summertime, never. She said that this story would be okay for me to tell. She also said that if I told the story, to mention that back in the, in the uh, Rancho times that we had here in Rancho Bernardo and other places around Southern California and San Diego, that it was the members of the Luceno and De Guino and Kumeyaay tribes that were sort of the support staff for all of the people who were pioneers and immigrants. They were the ones that were the cowboys. They were the ones that herded the, the cattle. They were the ones that uh, helped in the shops and that cooked and cleaned things. And she said also, 
And so they made it really possible for a lot of development to happen here. She also said that if I told that story that I should re remind everybody that members of that tribe, they're still around. Sometimes we think of the Indians as being a long, long time ago, but they're still here and they're still doing a lot of important things for the area. If you get a chance to speak to somebody who's a member of one of those tribes, I think it would be illuminating to you. So in, um, in thinking about that, in thinking about the native tribes, I came upon a story from a friend of mine, uh, retold by a friend of mine named Fran Stallings. And it's not a story of a local Indian, but it's stories that came, this is a story that came from the Northwest from around the Washington State area. But I know that there was a fair amount of commerce because the ocean, of course, is, uh, is a road for commerce. So there were inland routes and there were water routes all along the coast from many, many years ago. And this is a story that I wonder, it might have been heard here, but you'll see why I want to tell you this story. It's a story about mink. Do you know about mink? My father, actually, when he was a kid, his family, had a fox and mink farm. And uh, they did a really good, uh, a good business with pelts until apparently during the 30s, they began importing fur pelts from Asia and the bottom fell out of the domestic fur market. That's it. Well, my father said that mink are terrible little creatures and he had several scars on his hands to prove it. Some unfortunate encounters he'd had with minks. But this is a story from a long time ago about a mink. And this mink was kind of a know-it-all. Whatever you said, the mink would say, I know that. And the mink also was a trickster. Liked to play tricks on people, make people look foolish. And so after a while, if you play enough tricks, then pretty soon nobody believes you. They don't believe anything you say, and you can't play tricks on anybody. And so the mink thought, well, I need something else to do. And at that time, he was lying on his back, looking up into the sky. And he saw the sun as it was making its way from east to west across the sky. And he thought, I'd like a job like that. So he decided to go to Sun and take over that job. He thought it was a pretty important job because everybody would be looking up and seeing you and seeing the important thing you were doing. So he figured that was just the job for him. So he found the tallest tree, climbed the tree, and then jumped from the tree into the skyland. I know that doesn't sound possible, but that's the way the story goes. And so he went to the home of Sun and knocked on the door. And the son's wife answered the door. And he said, hi, I, I'm the son's uh, cousin. And the son's wife looked at him and she thought, he doesn't look anything like my husband. He had that long, furry body, those little short legs. But one thing she knew is you should always be polite to relatives. Is that right? Yes. And so she said, well, my husband is busy you know, he's taking the sun from east to west. He does that every day. I know that, said Mank. I'll wait. She said, yes, come in. And then he'll be home soon. So after a while, the son came home and his wife met him at the door. His wife said, we have a visitor. He says he's your cousin, but he doesn't look anything like you. He's got a long, furry body, little short legs. I was polite to him, though, because, you know, you should always be polite to relatives. Oh, said son, that sounds like mink. I bet he's here to play some kind of a trick to make us look foolish. Maybe we could make him look foolish. So, son came in, and mink said, Hi, I've come to take over your job. You must be getting kind of old and tired. I can, I can do what you do. I said, I don't know, said son. It's a pretty hard job. you got to take that torch of the sun all the way across the sky from east to west every single day. It's hot, it's heavy work. I said, I know that. I can do that. I said, all right then. Come tomorrow morning and I'll give you a chance. So the next morning, Mink showed up. And the son handed him a, a, a torch with pitch on it. A pine pitch. And he lit it on fire. Pretty soon it was blazing away. He said, just take this. All you got to do is take it from east to west. I know that, said Mink. And so Sun handed him the torch and also a long pole. Well, at first it was fine. Mink was going along. Everything was great. But after a while it got hot and the torch got heavy. And then he came to the River of Stars. Now the River of Stars, we usually call that the Milky Way. You can see it at night sometimes. It's there during the day too, but you can't see it during the day because it's 
it's too light outside, but it's still there. Well, so the mink, with his torch, came to the river of stars. And he thought, how am I going to get across this? He went up and down looking for a bridge, but there was no bridge. He thought, well, I'm just going to have to jump across then. And he looked at the pole that he had, and he thought, this is just going to weigh me down. I don't need this. And he threw it away. What he didn't know was that that pole was what Sun always used to vault himself across the river. And he threw that away. He came to the part of the river of stars that he thought was the narrowest. And he took a run and start, and he jumped and splash. He didn't make it. Fell right into the river with a big splash. And when he splashed into the river with his burning torch, it went, went out. And so down on the earth, it got dark in the middle of the day. People were a little bit worried about that. Well, actually, a lot of people were a lot worried about that. Well, Sun had figured something like that would happen. So he had his back up torch. He lit it on fire and he went back into the sky and he finished the job. It got light again on the earth. People were quite relieved. And he finished the day just fine. But Mink, who oh, Mink was embarrassed at having failed so badly. So Mink never tried to take Sun's job over again. I guess he thought of other people to trick, uh, other ways to make people look foolish. He's probably still doing that now. But you can learn a few things from this story like this. The people in that native tribe say that that was the first eclipse. And maybe you know that there's an eclipse coming next week. They said that it teaches us a few things, that sometimes it gets dark, even in the middle of the day. But it's OK, because the light always returns. And in fact, Sun, now, every now and again, he puts out that torch on purpose. Waits a little while, lights it again. So the people will know that even if it gets dark with an eclipse in the middle of the day, the light will come back. So that's one thing you learn from this story. Another thing is, it's not always good to be a trickster and a tease. And another thing I suppose you could take away is that no matter what, it's always a good idea to be polite to relatives. But then, <laughs> you knew that, right? <laughs> All right. So that is a story from a, a native tribe from the Washington area. Well, yes, if at some point <laughs> you need to be done with this, feel free. Listen as long as you like and as long as you can. So there were many interactions, of course, between the natives here in this area and the settlers who came later. And a lot of the time, they were very friendly interactions. Sometimes, though, there was a little bit of tension, sometimes more than just a little bit. But here's a story that I find kind of amusing that comes from the, from the settlers' times. Apparently, this was from a place that was out away from the rest of the folks. And uh, this particular day, everybody in the family, everybody on the ranch was out doing other jobs. And there was a woman who was left there. She was working too. She had a job to do, a job that was going to take her all day long. She was making soap. Yeah. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that? <laughs> Make soap. Everything, so many things, the, the basics that we think of just running to the store to get. They had to make, and it took a lot of hard work and a long time. So she had a fire outside and a big pot, and the lye and the fat, the ingredients for soap, and she was stirring with a large stirring stick. Stirring, stirring, she knew it was going to take hours, hours, but she was stirring. And then, and she heard the sound of, of horses arriving, and there were two natives that came galloping up on horseback. Now this worried her a little bit because she was all alone. She didn't think they would actually do her harm, but she had heard that there was a, a, an idea recently that, you know, we always like exotic foods, right? So some of the natives thought, oh, if you could get one of those settler women, one of those white women to cook for you, that would be something new, that would be something interesting, that would be something extra delicious. So sometimes, if they found the opportunity, they'd take one of those women with them to come back to their settlement and cook for them. So she was a little worried they might want to do that. 
Well, they dismounted and they came over. They clearly did not speak English, and she, of course, did not speak their language either. But they began to motion to her what their intentions were. Come, come, come with us. You will fix us food. You will fix us food. And she was like, no, 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 I will not come. They said, yes, yes, come, come, come. You will fix us food. You will cook for us. No, she said, no. Yes, they said, come with us. You will fix us food. You will cook. She said, no. One of the natives pointed to the big pot of soap that she was stirring, pointed to that, and he went, there's the food. She said, oh, they think the soap is food. No, 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 no. She said, no, 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 not, not food, not food. But the Indians insisted. And finally, frustrated, he grabbed that stirring stick out of her hand, blew on it a little bit, and tasted it. Have you ever tasted so inadvertently? Yeah. <gasps> <laughs> Well, those two Indians, they got back on their horses and they galloped away as fast as they could. And later, somebody in town heard that there was a the story that had gone around that native settlement that don't bother to get any of those settler women to come cook for you. They are terrible cooks. You can't eat that food. So that's a story about soap making and interactions with natives. Um, oh, that's right. I was going to show you. Todd, tell you a little bit about some of the toys that kids had and some of the pastimes that kids had. You know, if you didn't, if you couldn't go down to Toys R Us and buy yourself some toys, you had to entertain yourself the best you could with the simplest things. One of the things that they could entertain themselves was with a loop of string, and uh, you could make things with it. Like this. Oh, oh. <laughs> and maybe some of you used to do this, like oh, Cat's yeah. Cradle or something like you think that. The Indians did that? Hmm? Uh, Indians actually did. Yes, natives did that, uh, especially the Navajo. The Navajo oh. did a lot of string figures that you can find. Oh, you know, it's interesting that a lot of the, uh, the traditional string figures, they're known, the same figures, in several different areas. Like some, a story for the string figure that's known in Japan is also a story that's known in England. But now this particular figure, one of my favorites, although it took me forever to learn. Um, do you know the name of it, anybody? Jacob's Ladder is what they call it. Jacob's Ladder, and maybe you know the story about Jacob's Ladder. It's a Bible story, but they call this Jacob's Ladder. You see, it could be sort of a ladder, although I think it would be kind of hard to climb. But when natives made this very same figure, they called it four diamonds. These are kind of squished diamonds, mm -hmm. but you can see why. So it's kind of interesting. In fact, um, not so long ago, I read something that was talking about if you ever had an encounter with an alien, you know, not like an alien from a different country, but an alien from a different planet. They said there's some things that you could carry with you that could help you maybe to communicate with that alien. One is coins of different sizes, so you could put them out and point out they would be the planets, and you point out one the sun and then the earth, this is where we live. And they said another thing that you could carry with you is a string, because very often it's sort of a playful, interesting thing that would capture attention and would require no actual verbal communication. I thought that was interesting. So you see, you should always have a string with you in case you encounter any aliens. But there's some stories that go with some of those strings, and, and I'll tell you a couple of my favorites. Once there was a man who had potatoes. He had a whole field of potatoes, and he was going to pick his potatoes. So he went out, and he picked a big pile of potatoes, and he put it in a big bag, and he tied it nice and tight. Then he went out, and he picked another big pile of potatoes and he put it in a big bag and he tied it nice and tight. And then he stopped and had some lunch. And then he went out and bought, picked another big pile of potatoes, put it in a big bag, tied it nice and tight. And then there were just a few potatoes left, so he picked a little bag of potatoes, put it in a little bag, nice and tight. He was so tired, he'd been working hard all day. He didn't even have dinner, he just went right to bed. He heard a sound, and he thought, oh no, I bet that's the robber. 
The robber that's been in the neighborhood. He's come to steal my crops. I better check on that. So he jumped up. He threw off his covers. And he went out in front of his house. But uh, the big sacks of potatoes, they were still there. He thought, well, I'm sure I heard something. Maybe that robber is hiding behind my house. So he went behind his house. The robber had been there. But while he was going behind the house, the robber came to the front of the house and stole all those potatoes. So that's one story with string. Here's another one. Once there was a woman, and she was weaving over and under and around and around and over and under and around and around, and then she heard a noise, and the noise went like this. What do you think it was? Do you think it was a bee? Well, she thought it might be a bee. So she looked this way, she looked that way. She didn't see anything, though. So she kept on weaving over and under and around and around. And then she heard the noise again. And she looked down. And in the middle of her weaving was the biggest mosquito in the whole world. It went flying around her face. It went flying past her eyes. It went flying under her chin. And she said, whoa, if that mosquito comes around me again, I'm going to get it. Sure enough, the mosquito went flying right past her face, and the lady went, mm. and the mosquito was gone. <laughs> <laughs> so if you are one of those people that knows string figures from your childhood, your fingers probably remember how to do that. Get yourself a string. In fact, I've got a string on it. Happy to get you. Get yourself a string and try that out. But I brought a couple of other things that uh, that kids back then might have played with. Excuse me, is that on the internet? One that I showed you already is the doll. Oh. You had to make a doll. If you had to make your own doll, you had a few possibilities. You could carve something out of wood, or you could make something out of scraps of fabric. And this is, of course, just made out of scraps of fabric. And then if you had some coal or something, you could make a face on it. If you had some more yarn, you could make hair. You could make different dresses for it to wear. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. Play with that. Or something else. Oh, I like this one a lot because one of the things that in some settlements, not all certainly, but in some, they were very eager to have toys that had a message. Can you guess what the message of this little toy Carved from wood, a little fur on it. What is it? Why you can take off the fur? Oh. It is a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> so you have something to play with, and then you also have a, a little uh, lesson to deliver about that. So there are. Would you like to take a look at that too? Oh, I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Then there were um, games. How can you figure out how to get? <laughs> yeah, she says, <laughs> what? No, tell me what else. Can you um, how to get both of those beads on one side of the of the little thing? And I used to know the answer to that. I don't know it anymore. I look, I look it up on the internet. You know, those poor pioneers. They did not have the internet to check out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Another, now I told you that that one string figure was called Jacob's Ladder, and probably you may have seen something else that's called Jacob's Ladder. And that's this little toy. Watch, and I'll show you what it does. Look, come here. It goes like this. Like this. And like this. Awesome, a toy called Jacob's Ladder. Do you have, did you have some of those? I remember having these and thinking, how does that work? But you look at it long enough and you can figure out what is how to do that. And I think, let's see, I think I brought you one more thing, maybe. Hmm. Maybe not, oh, I thought I had a, a bag of marbles that were made out of clay. Oh, I know, this, this is a toy that, has variations all over the world. This is an especially tricky one. Most of the time, you'll see a ball on the end and a cup on this side. So you just swing that up and catch it in the cup. But on this one, this is advanced cup and ball because what you have to do 
is catch the ball on the peg. Whoa, much harder, much, much harder. Yeah, it's just fine. I know. Yes. There's Jacob's ladder. Your mom can show you how to do that. Exactly. And then I know that they, uh, one of the things that I brought the last time I was here has sort of this um, grim story that goes with it. There's a little doll that was very, very popular back then. Oh. Uh, frozen Charlotte dolls that were imported from Germany and from England. And they became attached to a story about a girl from Maine yeah. who was going to a fancy dance. And her mother said, you should wear a coat. And she said, no, 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 no. The coat will wrinkle my clothes. But it was a New Year's dance in Maine. And by the time she got to the dance, she was frozen. So there's another toy. No, and there's some others. <laughs> there's a toy that also has a lesson with it. And the lesson is, always listen to your parents or bad things can happen to you. So but those were sort of the, um, the Barbie dolls of the age. And they have, oh, you can get little tiny dresses to go with them. This is a replica of a couple of other ones too. All right. And now I have some other possibilities of stories to tell you. I know a couple of them you probably have heard before. I know there's one more thing in here that's a toy. It's a whistle. Do any of you, did you, any of you ever make whistles out of slippery, um, slippery birch twigs? I was remembering this, you know, these things come back to your mind when you least expect it, but I remember very well being with my grandparents and my grandfather showing us how to make a whistle. He would take a, a twig about this, about this uh, girth and the bark of some plants is sort of slippery. And so you could slide the bark off, make a little notch in the wood, and when you slid the bark off, it would make a nice whistle. I don't know. If we, maybe it would be good if we had some of those things mm -hmm. today. I don't know. Ah, yes, and you do remember, don't <laughs> you? All right, nice. Uh, recently, I was doing a button on that. Right. Right. <laughs> a button on the string, yes. I gave you the right kind of string that sings. Yes. And I remember it was some type of toy or whatever and it would sing. So. Yeah, I think if you come up toward a sort of firm, I, used, I usually have one of those in my basket, a uh, button on a string, and it usually has to be not yarn, like not soft like this, and not thin like thread, but like button carpet, carpet twine or something that's very, very, that's quite fine and, and quite stiff. Yeah, makes it really a really nice thing. Well, so I want to tell you this, a story that comes from my great-grandfather, and it's a story of ingenuity as well. And I did tell this the last time I was here, but it's a story that I love. My great-grandfather came across the plains in the 1800s. He was 12 years old. By the time he was 19, things had been settled a lot more where they lived, and they had some crops to send back to sell along the Missouri River, where you could go up and down the river in a river boat and, and uh, encounter lots of different towns and sell, your, sell whatever it was that you'd brought back. And then, so they could take things back in, in covered wagons, and then they would bring back from the east equipment, farm equipment or industrial equipment, and people, more people to settle. And so they were organizing a huge wagon train of about 70 wagons. And most of the Teamsters were men who were used to that, men in their 30s and 40s. But my great-grandfather, Thomas, he was tall and he was strong. Shall I put this up on the table? That way you won't be too tempted. He was tall and he was strong, and so he was, he got one of the jobs. So, uh, I know. You can be the storyteller, and I bet you can do it, too. So he had a little bit of uh, advance notice, and his mother knew that he was going to need new clothes. Because you know how fast kids grow. 
Just wait till she's a teenager. They grow so fast. So you can imagine that between 12 and 19, Thomas had grown a lot. And he had just recently had a growth spurt. He hadn't had great clothes to begin with coming across the plains. There was never enough room in those wagons. In fact, as I was thinking about this, um, this cloth doll, I recently learned about my great great aunt who emigrated to the United States in the mid 1800s and 1862 from Denmark. And her little sister, who was five, had a precious thing that she had was a doll with a china head. And when they came, to, got to Omaha, and they got ready to cross the plains, her parents said, you can't take the doll. We just don't have it. But she begged and pleaded and begged and pleaded. And finally, her mother made a little compromise. And the compromise was this, we'll just take the china head. And then when we get where we're going, we'll make another body for it. But in fact, they never did make another body for that head. The, the little girl was persuaded when they got where they were going and really needed everything <coughs> to trade that head for a big hen to give them eggs. So there weren't, kids didn't have a lot of valuable toys back then. Anyway, my great, my great grandfather Thomas, he needed new clothes. His mother thought, well, at the very least, he needed a new pair of pants. So she arranged for a neighbor to weave a frame of cloth, nice tight weave so it would really wear well. It was made of cotton and she gleaned the cotton yes. one the summer before and it spun the, the uh, thread and so she set up a big frame and wove a huge piece of cloth. And then Thomas's mother started out and being very judicious about how she cut things out, she cut out this pair of pants. She wanted them to last for a long time so she made double turn up on the cuffs and extra wide seams and uh, he was pretty happy with those. He wasn't going to wear them on the trail. He could wear his old patch clothes. The, uh, the thing that people said was a patch on a patch with a hole in the middle. His clothes were kind of like that, but he wore them on the trail. But he put his new pants and his best Sunday shirt, changed underwear in a box, and he had that in the, in the wagon. Well, when they got to the first town, the first trading post, the first place of civilization along the trail, Thomas was pretty excited about going in to see what there was to see. So he got washed up and he put on his good shirt and his new pair of pants and he was walking toward the, the fort. And he was walking by there were a couple of the older Teamsters who were older, 30s probably, sitting on a log watching people walk by. When they saw Thomas walk by, they started making fun of him. This seems to be a theme in some of these stories, right? They started to say, well, you look at that. Where do you suppose he got those pants? Now, they were dyed with rabbit brush and, 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 and vegetable dye. They were dyed kind of light green. They said, look at that color. That it just knocked your eyes out. That's not what right, kid. That's not what cowboys wear. Well, Thomas was young enough and unsure enough about himself that he stopped and said, what do cowboys wear? They said, ah, oh, cowboys. Cowboys wear buckskin pants. They never wear out. They're tough, tough like men. You need a pair of buckskin pants. And Thomas said, well, where would I get those? And they said, well, it's your lucky day, kid. I'd be willing to trade you my buckskin pants for those great pants of yours. And I said, I don't know. They said, well, just give it a try. You'll see. And before you know it, that man had slipped out of his buckskin pants, and Thomas they went behind a bush, and he slipped out of those green, new green pants. He handed them to the guy who slipped them on him. Those two guys took off running, leaving Thomas there in his underwear and a pair of buckskin pants. Well, he hadn't noticed that that guy was shorter and stouter than he was. He put those pants on. They'd been obviously wet and dried and wet and dried. They could stand on their own. And he pulled them on, and the knee parts came up pooched out right about mid-thigh, and, and the pants ended up right about mid-calf, and it kind of pooched out the back. He thought, so we have to wear these. And so he felt embarrassed. He went back, to, didn't go into the town, he went back to his wagon, and he just sat there feeling like he'd been had. But then he started to think about what he might be able to do. And so he took off those buckskin pants, he put on his old patched pants, he spread them out, flattened them out the best he could, took his sharp knife, and cut several very thin strips of that buckskin. Then he went out along the river and got uh, 10 lengths of willow branch, about two and a half feet long, about this wide, about this big around, 
And he brought those back to the wagon too. Well, he tapped down those strips of buckskin and he began a braid, nice, tight, even braid. When he finished it, he made a little fringe at the end, tapped it onto the end of one of those sticks and he had himself a very nice horseman. And he made 10 of those. He made them actually while he was on the trail. You know, these days we say, don't text and drive, don't, you know, don't read your messages and drive. But then with the oxen that walked slowly and just followed the oxen in front of them, there was only one trail. There were not a lot of side trails, not a lot of side traffic. If those oxen just went on going. You could just keep sort of an eye on the road and do pretty much whatever you wanted. So he wove those, those whips while he was on the trail. When he finished 10 of them, he put up a little sign that said, whips, $2. So like that. Well, the next time they came to a fort to an outpost, he was ready. He had on his old clothes, but he had and so he went into that fortress. He came to the, the general store, watched for a while to kind of see the lay of the land, and then he made his purchases. That $20 got himself a suit of clothes, pants, and a jacket, a new shirt, shoes, socks, souvenirs for his sisters and his mother, and a little box to hold them all in. And the clerk said, Shall I just uh, fold those up and put them in the box? And he said, no, I want to wear those out of here. You ever been so excited about a purchase you decided to wear it home? Well, that's what he felt like. So there he was in his brand new suit with everything else in the box tucked under his arm as he walked back to his wagon. And as he walked along, he saw sitting on a log those same two guys. And they saw him. And they were surprised. They said, ooh, wait, look at that. Whoa, hey kid, where'd you get them new duds? And Thomas, he didn't look to the right or the left, just kept right on walking as he said, oh, these, uh, I got them in a trade for a pair of buckskin pants. <laughs> so that's a true story of my great-grandfather. But you had to be, you had to use some ingenuity. You had to use what you had to do what you needed with it. And so I thought that I would um, end with a story. I thought, well, if there were a lot of kids here, I'd have them hold up the signs. But um, I'll show you. I got a, yeah, not necessary. For adults, we're okay with that. There's a replica of a $100 bill from the mid-1800s. A little larger than life, really has Abraham Lincoln on it, as you see. But this is a story about the rancho days. And of course, here in this area, it was all about ranchos, right? Mexican-American land grant, people with cattle. And uh, this story is about a ranch with a lot of cattle. There were a couple of big droughts in the mid-1800s. I think 1855 or so, there was a drought, lasted about three years. There was a small box of it. There was another drought. There were some hard times, there were. And so this particular day, the rancho owner called his foreman to him and he said, you know, I'm done. We just, we just can't keep this up. We can't keep this number of cattle and this number of employees around. We just don't have the resources for it. What I want you to do is just keep a few cattle as a seed herd, take the rest of them into town, which around here would have been, oh, Bakersfield or maybe further north than that. Um, or maybe just San Diego, but probably more likely North. Take them into town, sell them, let the boys go. Said, I'm sorry, but that's what I gotta do. Well, Joe, the foreman said, I, I, I know that's what you gotta do. I'll be happy to help. So he got the boys together, told them the situation, and they headed out the next day, rounded up the cattle, and headed north to sell the cattle. Well, it took him about a week. He let the boys go as soon as they got into town, and then he began negotiations for selling his cattle. It took a while. It took a week. Uh, the cattle were kind of scrawny, but he finally made what he thought was a pretty good deal. He didn't mind being there because he got to stay at the hotel. Nice, cushy bed, good food, and uh, there was usually a card game going on downstairs in the evening. And the last night that he was there, he won in that card game a hundred dollars. Well, when he finished the sales, he went back to the rancho 
And he reported to the ranch owner, gave him the receipts, told him what had happened. And, and he said, now, if, if you don't mind, I've got a couple of errands to do in town. And the rancher said, that's no problem. Do what you need to do. I'll see you at dinner. So he took that $100 bill and he took it down to the saloon where he gave it to Miss Sally. He said, Miss Sally, I know that, that last night before we went, the boys and I kind of tore up the place. I'm real sorry about that. And uh, here's $100 to kind of help fix up what we wrecked. She said, oh, you know, I didn't worry about that. I know times are tough and I know the boys were sad about losing their jobs and all. But I sure am glad for that hundred dollars. And so when the foreman was gone, Joe the foreman, well, Miss Sally, she put on her bonnet and she headed down the street to the grocer. And she said, times are tough. I know you've been keeping me on credit. He said, yeah, you and most of the rest of the town. She said, well, here's a hundred dollars to put against my bill. And he thanked her for that. And as soon as she was gone, he took that hundred dollars and he took it down to the funeral director, the undertaker. And he said, you know, I know that when my grandmother died last winter, I couldn't have even afforded a pine box. But you gave her a fine funeral with all the trimmings and didn't charge us a cent. Here's a hundred dollars. Well, that funeral director, he was mighty glad to get that hundred dollars. And as soon as the grocer was gone, he took that down the street to the livery stable where they kept his black horses in oats and grain, whether he could pay for them or not. He gave that hundred dollars to the livery stable owner. The livery stable owner was very relieved. And he took that hundred dollars and he took it out to the farmer who he bought the oats and grain from on credit most of the time. The farmer could hardly believe his good fortune because his rent was due. You see, he didn't own his farm. He leased the land and he paid rent on it every month. He leased the land from the man who owned most of the land in that area, the rancher. So we went out to the rancher and he gave him that hundred dollars. Well, that night at dinner, there was just a cook and a couple of household servants and the rancher and Joe the foreman. The rancher stood up and he, and he said, Joe, I want to tell you, I just really appreciate what you did for me. You, you, uh, you sold the cattle, you brought me back all the accounts and the receipts, you did a fine job. He said, so in addition to your regular pay, I'd like you to have this hundred dollars. And he gave me a hundred dollar bill. He said, now I've got a little favor to ask you. You know, it looks kind of like a storm out there. And we just got that, those few cattle, that seed herd. I'd hate to see them stampede off. Would, it, would you be able to spend the night out there on the ranch with them? Make sure everything's okay? Oh, sure, said Joe. I was kind of tired of that cushy hotel bed anyway. So he got a bed roll and a few provisions, and he went out onto the ranch to watch over the cattle. Built himself a little campfire, made himself some coffee, and some scrambled eggs and bacon. And then, as the sun set, he held that $100 bill up to that dying light of the sun. He looked at it. And he held it down to that campfire so close that one of the corners got over here. And he watched as that $100 bill burned down till it reached the sun, and then he dropped the last of it into the campfire and watched it disappear. Well, he figured that that $100 bill had done about as much good as it could do in one day. And in any case, he'd always known it was counterfeit the minute he won it in that car. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story from the Rancho Times of a $100 bill. Thanks for coming, being a good listener. I appreciate that. I hope you come for all of their programs. It always sounds like they're doing so many really good things here. And hey, she was pretty good. Yeah. Well trained, well trained.